Hello, and thank you for joining us in this OncLive Peer Exchange titled, Questions and Controversies in Treating Breast Cancer. Evidence-based management of breast cancer has become increasingly complex, owing to gains in understanding disease biology, as well as the introduction of newly approved drugs. As we continue to refine the use of systemic therapy, we are faced with the challenge of integrating newly approved agents into our current practice patterns. In this OncLive Peer Exchange panel discussion, my colleagues and I will contemplate some of the yet unresolved questions in breast biology to provide guidance in treating your own patients. We'll discuss the newest FDA approvals and emerging data. I am Dr. Adam Brusky, and I am Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and Associate Director for Clinical Investigation at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Participating today in our very distinguished panel are Dr. Carlos Arteaga, Director for the Center of Targeted Therapies and Director of the Breast Cancer Program at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Jose Baselga, Physician-in-Chief and Chief Medical Officer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, Professor of Medicine and Assistant Professor in Radiation Oncology at the Duke Cancer Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Deborah Tripathi, Professor and Chair for the Department of Breast Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And finally, Dr. Denise Yardley, Senior Investigator of the Breast Cancer Research Program and Principal Investigator at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. So we really now have a plethora of riches in breast cancer. I think that um, you know, we now, in all three really, uh, clearly in, in ER positive disease and in HER2 positive disease, we have a lot of things that are new. Even now, we're starting to approach triple negative disease. But let's start with um, ER positive metastatic breast cancer uh, and really talk about CDK4-6 inhibitors and in particular ribociclid. Um, you know, it's the new kid on the block. It's second to the market. Um, you know, what's going on with ribociclid, Denise? What do you think? Well, I think the Mona Lisa 2 data was quite exciting and I think really resonated the enthusiasm we have now for uh, combining targeted agents with our endocrine therapy, which used to be a standard as monotherapy. And I think the Mona Lisa 2 uh, demonstrated, much as what we'd seen in the signal with palbociclib, that adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor to first-line postmenopausal women um, that are ER positive that demonstrated an improvement in the progression-free survival, um, almost doubling that. In, in while the median survival, I think, still for the ribocyclob group has not been reached, what we saw is the control arm seems to be very consistent with letrozod, about 14.57 months, what we saw with the Paloma 2 data. Um, and I think what we see is now being able to enrich what we're offering our first-line endocrine patients uh, with delaying, I think, the role of chemotherapy and being able to add another novel agent to endocrine therapy and extending um, patient outcomes. So again, it's second to market. I'm gonna go back a little bit and just ask these guys, all of you, a question. I mean, I think it was at this meeting four years ago, was it ASCO 2013 or San Antonio 2013, where Rich Finn presented the phase two from Paloma One. Did people believe that when it first came out? What was your thought? Carlos, when you first saw that data, were you familiar with the CDK46 pathway when well, you saw it, this? It turns out that at the time, and Jose knows this paper, we had published a paper that supported the idea that when tumors escape uh, from horm being hormone dependent, they rely on CDK4. Really? So I found those data quite plausible. Uh -huh. And I think that this was a small study, not enough to, to, to generate change patterns of care, but enough to do the randomized studies that were preceded to that. Yeah, but to be honest, I think the magnitude of the data was, was something that we had, at least I did not expect it initially. I mean, it was really spectacular. And then when the phase two data came out, the randomized phase data, the data we said, you know, this data is too good to be true because it's, uh, it's not blinded and maybe there's a bias in that. And now we have the data with ribociclib, now we have the follow-up Paloma studies, and the story is a very clear one. I mean, this has changed forever the way we treat patients with breast cancer and the magnitude of the size, as you mentioned, we're talking about hazard ratios of 0.5. Uh, you're doubling. Which, you're doubling. You doubling. take whatever hormone therapy you have, you just double it. The point I was making it was there was a mechanistic <coughs> basis for the combination to be better. Yeah, there was. <clears throat> and and you know, the other thing, Adam, I'm surprised is that I didn't believe that there was no toxicity. I mean, there's toxicity with each of these CDK inhibitors, right. but you see that rate of neutropenia in a 160 patient study, which was Paloma 1, 
and you're thinking, now why didn't they see febrile neutropenia? But now we have several large phase three studies, both in combination with AI and fulvestrant, and the rate of febrile neutropenia in most of these studies is less than 2%. So I think not only the magnitude of the benefit when Rich, I think it was San Antonio a couple years ago, presented Paloma One and that separation of curves that we love to see at these national meetings, but really the fact that um, patients aren't necessarily paying a price to get this additional benefit because there's a lot of drugs emerging that have small differences in the curves and there's a fair amount of toxicity whereas this is in my in my opinion that's just not the case with the CDK. And we have to keep in mind that the natural history of hormone receptor positive breast cancer is quite long and so I'm, I'm as encouraged as everyone else is uh, with the differences in PFS. There's no difference in overall survival that has emerged yet uh, but the number of deaths in all these trials is, is still pretty low, so we will have to wait and see if this emerges. But could it be conceivable that you now have a PFS of 24 months, 30 months even, if you believe the investigator, the, the outside thing, and, and, and even higher, you know, in some of these trials, and ribociclib is probably somewhere between 24 to 30 months. You have a PFS of almost more than two years, and you're not going to see a survival benefit? We, well, we, really? we, don't, we don't know that. We, we don't, we don't know, know it yet, but we do don't seriously? know why, why, why do patients escape uh, resist, uh, uh, sensitivity to CDK4-6 inhibitors? Are there fundamental defects in cell cycle control? Are, is there loss of retinoblastoma function? That could be something that could actually... Or use of cyclin E. Actually, that seems to be the latest theory, right? right? Cyclin E. And, and so are cyclin E isoforms and, and, and other uh, putative mechanisms of resistance that may not necessarily be specific to CDK4-6 inhibitors, but may render the tumor different in some way. So I think uh, w w we can't really guess what's going to happen. We actually have to see uh, what happens with follow-up of these patients. Now, most of the trials do not follow these patients indefinitely. There, is, uh, there are a couple of registries that are getting set up that will follow patients through multiple lines of therapy. Nice. Really, there are and I think registries. we will learn from those, yes.